<laughs> right, has everybody got their microphone switched on? Yeah. I think it's on. Right, well, um, fellow councillors, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Health and Wellbeing Scrutiny Committee being held on the 17th of September 2024. Um, just to remind members that this meeting is being recorded and will be available to the masses on YouTube, and no doubt it will be very popular. I've had apologies from uh, Councillor Andy Wells. Are there any other apologies? I believe Councillor Turner is either late or not going to be able to make it. Thank you. Are there any other apologies? Uh, moving on to the minutes of the previous meeting. Um, they were with the agenda and they're here for approval. Is anyone who is here um, willing to indicate that they are a true and accurate record of those proceedings? Thank you, Councillor Doyle. It's seconder. Thank you, uh, Councillor Pallet. All those in favour? Thank you very much. Um, declarations of interest. Um, can I ask whether there are any interests to be declared for the purposes of this meeting and any items on the agenda? I always take silence as assent, by the way. Okay, there being um, no declarations of interest, um, the next item is update from the chair, and it tells me that I might want to advise you that the um, last meeting of the Health Overview and Scrutiny Committee at uh, the county was held on the 17th of July and the 25th of July. That's a long meeting, isn't it? <laughs> and the minutes and recordings are available online. The next meeting is due to be held on the 23rd of September, and I think Democratic Services have shared the link to that meeting. Are there any questions on any of that? Thank you. Moving on, um, responses to reports of the Health and Wellbeing Scrutiny Committee. We have none at this time. Consideration of matters referred to the Health and Wellbeing Scrutiny Committee from Cabinet or Council. We have none at this time. Uh, moving on to item seven, update on health-related matters considered by Staffordshire County Council. Now, unfortunately, Councillor Jones isn't here to report, nor do I have a written report, um, but the digest was attached to the agenda, which I will take as read. Are there any questions on the digest? If not, I have one. Um, I mean, the digest is, is an interesting read. If you haven't read it, I suggest you do, um, because it, it identifies seven deliverables and two key priorities being safe, timely and sustainable care and um, meeting capacity, meeting the capacity challenge of the system, whilst at the same time reporting a £91 million deficit. What I am not clear about is how those key priorities are to be delivered in such difficult financial circumstances. And if we'd had a representative here, I would have asked that question, but I think I will ask it in writing if we can do that between now and the next one. There is no purpose in having deliverables if you haven't got the capacity to deliver them. Right, are there any questions on that? We don't have to, to do any kind of voting on that, no. do we? It's just for information, isn't it? Um, housing strategy biannual update to the 30th of June, um, 2024. So I'm being whispered at here. Um, and I understand we have Lisa Hall, is that? Are you Lisa Hall? <laughs> Well, it's really nice to meet you, Lisa. <laughs> yes. uh, ben, do you want to introduce this item? I'm not Lisa Hall. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so the purpose of this report is to update the committee on actions within the uh, within the Tamworth Borough Council housing strategy to the 30th of June 2024, which directly impact on health and well-being of the Tamworth communities. 
The Health and Wellbeing Scrutiny Committee were given an overview of the Tamworth Borough Council housing strategy from 20, uh, 2021 to 2025 at the meeting on the 12th of July 2022. The committee requested an update on all actions and all relevant data sets as they relate to health, the health and wellbeing uh, of the Tamworth communities on a quarterly basis, revised to biannual at the meeting in January 2024. The report highlights relevant council and partnership actions and emerging data sets available as of the 30th of June 2024. A new contractor has been appointed to undertake the work on an updated strategy for 2025 to 2030. Information in this report is presented in line with priori priority areas identified in the housing strategy 2020 to 2025, and as it relates to health and as it relates to the health and well-being of Tamworth communities. Um, I just also like to apologise. There are ten appendices on this report, so well done if you got through them all. Um, but happy to open to questions and comments. If there are any comments or questions on uh, sorry questions on data sets. Um, from third parties or partners, we're happy to take those away and then I'll come back to committee and update with those answers or if you'd prefer them in a written form, whichever you prefer. Thank you, Councillor Clark. Do you want to add anything to that, Lisa? No, just I mean, Sorry, there we go. What I would like to add is while the report is up to June 24, that is for the purpose of our partner agencies such as CAB, for third parties, there was information in the main report <coughs> that relates to the departments that was in the council, and those actually go on to be up to date to August 24. So that's why there's some differences in dates around it. So I'll just, unfortunately, it is rather a large report, so I apologise for that. Um, it's because it's such a large report, the last time that we bought it in January, we agreed to perhaps space out the time limits that we bought because it takes an awful long time to compile it all so in order to cut back on staff time a bit we've put the report so it is up to date for our purposes up to the end of august so if i just i'm not going to talk you through all of it i'll do it by exception because we'll be here a very long time so priority one is around the the new homes and affordable housing in tamworth we started off with the new homes at uh, dostill on the border of two gates those have now extended out to the Maple Vale properties, which are on Coton Lane, um, down by the Fox Public House, for those of you that have gone down there. Um, so we're up to those at the moment. Those are just going through. There's a further release of those in December, and there's some more that have just come up for reservation now. So they're two beds and three beds, and they have a 30% discount available with a certain criteria. That criteria is quite vague at the moment so there's nobody really excluded from that so um they are going very very quickly um so we've got their fuel poverty just to advise um we have had a new contractor i'm sure you're all very familiar with beat the cold put it out to contract and the new contractor is community home solutions known as chs in nottingham um so we've delivered here the Quarters reports for Beat the Cold, and in a slightly different format, we have delivered quarter one for um, CHS. The unfortunate thing about CHS is their next tranche of data is due out in October, so we've literally missed it by a couple of weeks, but it will obviously be in our next report here. Um, as you can see, there's various steams going in, um, the HUG, the Eco Floor, the GBIS. They're all things around property insulation, changes of heating, upgrade, um, with net zero at the back of some of those. So those are what we predicted, those are what we actually got. Um, the take-up for the Great British Insulation Scheme wasn't as great as we expected. However, that is work in progress. There's some um, advertising going out there, stuff going on our socials and leaflet drops around promoting that work. Um, so that, that's working very well. Um, we supported two homes with major energy efficient measures um, and then some homes are just having some more minor works put in such as cavity walls such as loft insulation um, but it, it absolutely varies they will go out to the property assess everything that needs doing to it um, and then we just ensure we've got budget to get that through um, tackling empty homes um, we have currently got comp funding which is the old covid funding um, for a temporary set of staff, 388 empty homes in Tamworth, kind of relevant on the basis that kind of matches 
more or less our housing waiting list. Um, we started work on identifying those, contacted all of the owners of those. Some of them were premature, they're, they're in probate, they're not able to move with them. Some of them we've made quick mins and we've got them back into circulation. We've got a handful of properties where we perhaps need to take the next steps to get those in because it's not just about the empty property, it's also about the effect it has on the local area. So we're looking to extend that. The funding ends 27th of September. We're looking to extend that work and to pick up that handful of cases and get those into the legal system to perhaps look at things like compulsory purchase orders so we can get those properties tidied up back into use. Some of those are noticeably quite large properties um, that, that are probably worth quite a lot of money. Um, so we will work with the landlord to say, do, do you want to do this or do we need to do it together? Or if that's not going to happen, what we need to do to get that done. The HMOs, the Houses of Multi-Occupation, had a little bit of an increase in those. Um, and that's where those properties need to comply with legislation. 59 active licences currently on that. have had a few calls coming in about potential HMOs and a few calls coming in from people that are purchasing properties about whether they could use it for a HMO, which is excellent because we want landlords to work with us, not against us. So if they get that right advice in the first place, they can progress it. Damp and mould service requests, uh, there to see. Had a bit of a blip in quarter one, but we would expect an increase in inquiries winter months. Um, and they always drop off summertime. Um, we have purchased some, some additional funding, um, some dehumidifiers, to help with damp and mould in properties. Um, the funding is there, one, to install it for six weeks, two, to pay for the electric usage for that six-week period. So they're averaging out about £55 to run for six weeks. So we take readings, they're on smart meters, we do that, we then reimburse for whatever it's cost that person to have it. If we've no demand for that dehumidifier, we've left it in situ. Um, if, we've, if we've had, but we haven't covered the additional energy costs, if we need somebody on the waiting list, we've taken it out, but they can apply to, to have it put back in at a later date. There's a case study there about that, um, about a man saying he's had the best sleep that he's ever had. Housing repairs, um, their jobs for damp and mould are on there at the moment. So they they again, they pick up winter time, they drop off summer time. So that's likely probably to increase. Um, the HMOs, this is the bit where we put in, where we've actually had to take some minor enforcement. So where we've had properties, we've identified something. This just lists what, what we've done if the hand, landlord hasn't complied or if the property is in such a state that we need to intervene immediately. Um, we've had no prohibition, no prohibition notices, which is always good to have. So the standard of housing is, is coming up because previously we have had one or two every quarter that's coming up. So it's good that that's changing. Um, eco for statement of, of intent, that is around um, properties that qualify for eco. Eco's got two criteria. One is a specific health condition, could be respiratory, could be a heart condition, or two is the household has less than £31,000 income into it. Um, we've had 21 applications, all of which we've approved, and then they've been passed on to contractors. We've already had a little bit talk about GBIS and their loft insulation and properties. Following reports around access to housing that promotes well-being um, and those are the reports that are attached to that. If you do have any questions, happy on those reports, happy to take them back and get them fed back to you. So over to you. All right, thank you. Um, the recommendation is that we're asked to endorse the report as presented. Are there any questions? Councillor Dorn. I'd just like to make an observation. Um, I see that the council has been quite comprehensive in the way it's approaching the fuel poverty, which is a good thing in considering current circumstances. So I congratulate them on that. Thank you. 
Yes, I agree with you. That was that was a piece of good news in all of this. Is there any other questions from anyone? This is going to sound like a stupid question, but you've obviously got five priorities. Is there, of the priorities, is there a higher priority or is it priority one first and then number two, number three, number four, number five? Or are they all equal? So they would all receive the same amount of time and attention to them. So yeah, they are equal. They're not all delivered by ourselves. Yeah. Some are delivered by third parties. That's fine because I was a little bit worried about priority five. No. Don't, yeah. Because I thought, okay. No, no okay. it's just delivered by third party. All right. Thank you. So just to to quickly follow up on that, um, if all of the priorities are equal, but the progress against them is not equal. What remedial action do you take to try and ensure that all for all of the priorities are being delivered? Right. So, in regard to the priority, sorry, in regard to the priority five situation, where we put it out to a third party, we have quarterly meetings with each of those that deliver that to monitor that they are, they're coming up with where we would expect to be on that program. If they weren't to be where we expected at that point, we would obviously give them opportunity in order to put that. Where it, where it needs to be. If that's not achievable, we do claw funding back um, and then we will be looking at other sources to provide that service. In-house, um, for our own performance, that's picked up by our, our performance around one-to-ones, conversations, where we need to perhaps put staffing and resource to if we're not delivering in one area for a certain reason. Um, for example, the community safety officer role is vacant at the moment, so that's been picked up by other members of the team in, in the short term. So we will put the appropriate what we need to do to do that. So internal is monthly monitoring. Um, everything that's external is quarterly. Because CHS are new, we're actually meeting with them on a monthly basis at the moment, and um, because they're obviously trying to establish what we want from them and how best to that deliver that. Beat the cold, we used to meet quarterly with because they have been with us for some years. Um, unfortunately, they chose not to apply for this contract. Um, however, I do feel at some stage we'll probably work with them in the future. Thank you very much. Any other questions? We're being asked to endorse the report as presented. Is anyone prepared to move? Thank you. Councillor Statham, is anyone prepared to second? Thank you very much. All those in favour, please show. Right, thank you very much for your hard work in, in presenting this report to us. Um, thank you, thanks to the officers and thanks to the portfolio holder for their work. Are there any questions in the meantime on the data sets? Drop them, drop me an email. Will do. Thank you very much. Um, moving on then to, and, and happy for you to go if you want. So. Even though you might find the rest of the fascinating, I'm sure. <laughs> Chair, I've just got an update for you. Apparently, Paul Turner's on holiday. Ah, thank you. So we'll, we'll record that as formal apologies then. Thank you very much. Um, Armed Forces Covenant Plan. Um, there was a briefing note circulated. Unfortunately, Joe Sands is not with us today, who wrote the briefing plan. Um, we do have the portfolio holder, Lewis Smith, is with us um, with regard to this plan, and we're being asked to consider the information. <coughs> not a, not a, a form of wording I'm particularly fond of, as you know, but also to endorse proposals for a council lead member and the updated Armed Forces Covenant Plan. Now, you've, you've seen the briefing note in front of you. You've seen the updated plan. Are there any questions with regard to it, either for the chair or for the portfolio holder, Lewis Smith? Would you like to make a statement? Yes, of course. Thank you, Chair. Um, I won't go too much because obviously I presented this uh, at the previous uh, Health and Wellbeing um, Committee. Um, in July. Um, in regard to this, so obviously it's just a briefing note with some of the updates, so we're asking uh, you to uh, endorse the proposals for the name change uh, from, um, from champion to council lead member. Um, following the advice of Nikki Hesketh, the monitoring, monitoring, sorry, I can't talk, monitoring officer, 
um, it was found that uh, cabinet members cannot be champions. There has been no previous formal recommendation uh, to cabinet that um, agreed that the champion must be an armed forces veteran or not the portfolio holder. So that's technically in regard to the lead member. Um, there's not necessarily a mandatory requirement to have an elected member champion. Um, also, there were some questions which were brought up. So the first one was regarding that. Obviously, we found out that um, cabinet that cabinet member can't be the champion. And there was a question regarding the hiring out of the lower law and body RPL as well. So that, after speaking with officers, um, they mentioned that um, that was in the previous budget. It was was agreed, but it wasn't put in place. So the cost of £1,000 um, for the RBL to hire out the low lawn uh, has been waived. Um, the only thing I really want to say uh, in regard to this would be that making myself the lead member is something which uh, we should definitely do, but the, 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 there's not really a reason why we can't have a champion as well. Um, in my opinion, so I don't want to be I don't want to be arrogant and uh, make a recommendation for yourselves, but um, I don't see why we can't have myself as the lead member on cabinet uh, to oversee the policy and then have a elected member to be the champion as well. So whether that's I know Tina or yourself have both uh, served and are part of the veterans community. So I just thought I'd mention that for consideration. Would, would doing something like that require a change in constitution? Do we know? So we could recommend to Cabinet that they consider the appointment of a champion alongside the lead member. Is everybody uh, content to do that? I'd support that. As this stands, I couldn't support this. Um, no disrespect to yourself, but I think that... Um, I know you've changed the title, but the role of being a champion for the armed forces should go to somebody with who's been a member of the armed forces, out of respect. Um, it, this is nothing against you personally. Uh, I do uh, agree with the idea of having an actual champion. Uh, it should be a non-political role to start with, um, but it should definitely be somebody from a military background. So I'd, I'd support the amendment. Thank you. So in terms of process, do we vote on the amendment first? Yeah, sure. Um, so the role of champion previously wasn't within uh, the cabinet role which I have taken on, um, but the previous cabinet holder, uh, Councillor Cooper, um, obviously was a member of the veterans community, which is why it was added into uh, my role. So originally coming into the role, um, it was going to stay within that role. Obviously, I've not served myself, but if we can take that ch uh, the champion out of the role and give it to someone who was a veteran. That I think, yeah, that makes sense. I think we're agreed there. Councillor Bailey. Sorry, just on what Councillor Dawler said about it being a non-political role, is there an opportunity to have somebody as the champion who isn't a sitting councillor? I don't know if that's an option. I don't know. I'm just going to be whispered at again yeah. very shortly. It is detailed as a champion, as a member who will champion an issue on behalf of the council, um, as appointed by the leader of the council. Um, examples are issues like heritage use, sports housing, business town centre. So I think at the moment, constitutionally, the champion does need to be a member. Um, obviously, we are having a constitution review at some point, so that is something maybe in the future that could change, but, but currently it does need to be. We haven't got anybody, have we, as a member? Yeah. Oh, we have. Oh. Oh. Okay. Yes, I am, despite my youthful appearance, a veteran. <laughs> I am, in fact. <laughs> Were you wanting to indicate? Oh, yeah. Um, 
it's a bit far away. Sorry, no, I do agree with what Councillor Doyle has said. However, Helen just said something to me quickly, which is interesting. So I think it's well and good that and we're lucky enough to have people on our council who have served within a military capacity. But the question that Helen said to me, but what if there wasn't someone that that hadn't served? So then that's going to create another... I'm not saying a problem in the future, but what would you do if there wasn't anyone that served? Who would that responsibility lie with? I think we're lucky enough we have, but no, go on. The only thing I can think of is that it would fall under my, well, my or whoever's holding my portfolio in the future if we haven't, but if we have, then obviously we can use that, to use the expertise for when we, when we have people who have served. Yeah, I know that. I think adding well. in the caveat, whilst there are serving members who are veterans, yeah. I think is sensible. Uh, you can claim exactly The only other thing I would add is that obviously we haven't got elections next year, but they change every year, don't they? So, you know, we need to have something in there that suggests that, you know, if we haven't got a serving member, then yeah. we'll look at some other solution. Councillor Statham. No, that, I think it's great then if we've got people that have military background like yourself and Councillor Clements, then they should definitely take that position. No offence to us, but, um, uh, but I agree with the sentiment that it, it comes from respect, that they should have that kind of role. Um, how, is that just a recommendation that we make then as a committee? Okay, fine. Yeah, we'll take to Cabinet. Okay, so how, how will we determine who, if, if we want it, if, well, if we're recommending you or Councillor Clements? If the, no, I mean, I don't really care who it is, <laughs> um, as long as they've got military service, I don't yeah. think it matters. Don't drink, don't drink that. Why have you poisoned it? Oh, it's a fly in it. Oh, right. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so that threw me completely then. Um, <laughs> right. What, what was I saying? Oh, yes. Yes, we can take a recommendation to Cabinet, and Cabinet can make a decision about who that champion should be. They should make a decision, A, that we have a champion, and possibly a thought about who that should be. Well, can I personally recommend Councillor Clements because she does a lot of work with Royal British Legion. I think everybody knows that she's very affiliated with that. So I personally would like to put forward, no, sorry, Chris, that we um, recommend Councillor Clements. That is if she wants the role. <laughs> can yeah. I make a suggestion? What? Um, we can do the selection in full council when all 30 members are here. Possibly and we can so. Pick a representative then. And it will give so. people the opportunity to put themselves forward. Does it belong to the guidance that you make recommendations? No, I think I don't think we can make a recommendation here. We haven't talked to anybody who is affected. Yeah. yeah. I don't think she'll refuse it. But we have to ask her first. Anything you want to add, Lewis, at this point? No. Okay, we have the um, amendment in front of us about a champion. Do you want to, to go through the wording again for me quickly? Yeah, so, uh Anyone prepared to move? Thank you, Councillor Doyle. Seconded. Thank you, Councillor Bailey. All those in favour, please show. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Councillor Smith, um, for your attendance and participation today. Um, you're free to, to stay or, or go as you wish. Um, item nine is the forward plan.
Is there anything on the forward plan that the committee wish to be considered here? Anything from anyone? Okay, moving on, because I always take silence as assent, as you know. Just one point. Yeah, go on. <clears throat> Can I suggest in future that we look at the scrutiny plan first and then the forward plan? Yeah. Because then we'll have an idea of what gaps there are, if any. I'm going to be suggesting a meeting after October's scrutiny committee at which we consider the future work of this committee okay. offline. I think it needs to happen. Do you, do you want right. that change making to the agenda order then? Because I... Yes, we could yes, do that. Yeah, yes, we could do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, item 10 then is working group updates. Um, we don't have any updates, um, but there are a couple of things that I think I wanted to, to bring forward. We did agree at a previous meeting that we should have a working group on the disabled facilities grant. We did agree that would happen. And, and I have now seen numbers which show me serious inequalities in the way the DFG is being allocated. And I think we do need to set up a working group to consider that. So I guess I'm looking for willing victims to be part of that DFG. I will certainly be on it. Councillor Hadley, thank you. Anyone else want to be on it? I'm trying not to look at anyone, if you notice that. <laughs> Councillor Bailey, are you willing to be on it? Thank you. Anybody else? No, I'm going to say Councillor <laughs> <laughs> That would serve him right, wouldn't it? <laughs> Great, that would be really helpful because I think what we need to do is get the evidence together which enables us to present a coherent case as to why those inequalities should not persist. I guess it's unacceptable that some of these um, organisations are giving money back while we don't have enough to meet the needs of the people of Tamworth. I don't find that acceptable. Okay, thank you very much. Um, there is one other small item under, under working group update. Um, I've asked that um, a report of the damp and mould working group come back to this meeting in October. Um, because I had a conversation with um, Councillor Sam Smith yesterday and it does make sense for the damp and mould working group to work to this committee rather than anywhere else because of the implications for the health and well-being of people who live in damp and mouldy properties. Uh, I think we saw that it's currently with corporate scrutiny, isn't it? Yeah, it's with the Housing Repairs and Working Group. And yeah. Corporate, so we'll yeah. ask them to come back to report yeah. back on the recommendations yes. that committee sent and see if there's yeah. any further work to do. Yep. Yeah. Okie doke. Um, I'm being asked to remind you that the next meeting is on the 24th of October where we have a safeguarding update and now damp and mould. Um, is there anything, anything else we want to add to the work plan at this point? What I will be asking people to do is to have a relatively short working meeting on the 24th, followed by a discussion about the future of this committee offline, as it were, so that we can just have an open and frank discussion about the work of this committee going forward. So I think it needs reviewing. You're looking troubled, Councillor Stather. You're looking very troubled, and you're playing with your phone. These are two danger signs, really. No, I was just confused if you meant this month or next month, but you meant next month so it's me getting confused just don't worry it's fine it's been a long day yes there is that small detail yes um, I, I, did, I did actually manage to get that bit done yes um, there is a, also a significant program of work around community cohesion which needs to be taken forward following on from what happened in Tamworth and I think we should be asking the question about whether some of that work should be taken up by this committee and, and to share the load across the scrutiny committees. Is there anything else we talked about? No. no. You had an item of any other business. Oh, yes, I did. Um, somewhere within these papers, 
there is a statistic saying that we only have currently 3% of pensioners on pension credit. That was something that alarmed me based on the fact that we now are not going to be paying out the, um, the winter fuel allowance. And I wondered if we could have some sort of statistics as to what, what the current position is in Tamworth, how many people would be entitled to it over a certain age. Um, we know there's a national figure, I think it's something like 800,000 people who aren't claiming it, but it'd be interesting to know in Tamworth what it would be like, what the figure would be. Councillor Dorr. Um, <coughs> going on uh, what Councillor Claymore has just said, it's not a bad idea. What we should also look at, at as well is how that message is being got out there to ensuring that people who are eligible are picking up on it. I mean, there, there are two key sources. The DWP is clearly one, but the Joint Strategic Needs Assessment by the County Council is another, and we need to be looking at all of those sources. Um, within my capacity, within my job working for Sarah Redwoods MP, which is on my declaration, um, what is happening, which I can share as it is public knowledge, people are receiving responses that Sarah is encouraging people to apply for pension credit and um, we are offering as um, an office to help anybody that is unsure. So anyone that is contacting Sarah about winter fuel is getting that straight away of you know, let's check if you're eligible, let's work together because there is that gap. And I think it would be really interesting to see what those numbers are. Um, but I want to reassure everybody that um, Sarah is very aware of the problem um, and is open and willing to support constituents through this because it is going to be a difficult winter. We all know that. Um, so it's about having that information ready and also what we can do as councillors when we have residents come to us who are concerned about it we can help them and direct them to check if they're eligible as well thank you councillor Stephen. Councillor Claymore. yeah thank you for sharing that and i appreciate that um but we are dealing with a demographic of people who do not or will not look at it as charity and I'm, I'm concerned that we, yes, people may approach the office, people may approach us as councillors, but could we get information so that we approach people, that we do it from the other point of view, uh, and yes, how we communicate it, because there are a lot of people out there, I'm pretty sure, that will not write to Sarah's office and will not come to a councillor. So we need to make sure that we are catching as many people as possible. But until we know the numbers, yeah. we, we can't do anything. Councillor Clark, and I'll, I'll come to you shortly. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I know this isn't like my portfolio, but um, after having some conversations over the weekend at the CTCIC, <coughs> um, <coughs> People from that organisation have got in touch with, with the council, with Joe Sands, um, with a proposition for a partnership, um, sort of cooperative approach to this. Um, the, the CRC have um, links into communities and into residences that we don't have as a council. I think this is going to take a, a multi-agency approach from the council, CIC, other charities, the MP. Um, so if that's a piece of work that, that, that this committee want, also want to want to be a part of, um, I don't want to speak out of turn, but like, you know, we want we want everyone in on this sort of thing. So. We will include it on the agenda for October's meeting. Yeah, I'll come to a minute. We'll, we'll include it on the uh, agenda um, for the October meeting. I'll just drop in for a cup of tea, actually. Uh, Councillor Bailey, did you? Yeah, sorry. Um, I was actually going to say about, you know, we should be speaking to people like age concern, but I think you're right about the pension credit. There are, we're told that there are quite a few people that aren't claiming pension credit when they should but what I would like to know is who isn't eligible for pension credit we've had the same with when we've looked at DFG they're just above that just above that line who are going to struggle because they're not going to get the you know that extra funding so I don't know if, if there's a way that we can see how many people are missing it because they're just above that line because they're the people that are going to be in, in fuel poverty 
So for me, same as we've talked about before, I know about DFG, but this is these are the people that are going to really struggle because they're just above the line. And it's the problem with thresholds of any sort, isn't yeah. it? If you're just above it, yeah. then you are going to struggle. Yeah. So I think that's that's something we can have a conversation about. Um, I just wanted to say that I completely agree with the sentiment that we need to be um, proactive rather than reactive because I think there's a lot of people within that category that don't use the internet that won't be able to simply just go online and check if they're eligible because it's not that easy so we need to be mindful that this has to be you know accessible um and i would love for us to be able to have that information but my only concern is how we access that information of those people who are eligible and how we would get the detail of who they are because i feel like there's some sort of gdpr that would be limiting us which is a shame um so i don't i don't know i think possibly like like ben's brought up it is a multi-agency approach and getting involved with the cic to essentially put it out there that this is where you can go for support i know that lee's got some fantastic stuff planned um but no i agree with you we have to be proactive and not reactive yeah, and it's very difficult for us to identify individuals because we will be in breach of GDPR almost, almost immediately if we try and do that. But what we can do is to say there's a general problem across Tamworth. There are 2,000 people just above the threshold and we need to reach out to those people, either through insulation or any other way we can find to, uh, to support them. So looking at another agenda item, sorry, so that needs one more, yeah. The agenda for the 24th is already getting longer and longer, <laughs> isn't it, really? Thank you for that, Councillor Claymore. Claymore. Mm. Claymore. Just following on from that, then. Um, yes, it would be very difficult to get individuals' names, mm. and, but maybe if we could do it in a, a ward, say, like, we know that there's 50 people in Hammington, and then the councillors in Hammington can... Mm hold some sort of surgery or put some leaflets down. We could do it ward-wide. Yes, that takes us neatly back to forgotten estates, but I'm not going to mention that anymore. <laughs> not going to mention that anymore. Right, is there any, uh, anything else on this item? I think it's an important one. We'll bring it back to the 24th of October. Anything else from you? Anything else from anybody else? I don't know whether it would be good maybe to have a working group specifically around the winter fuel allowance. Um, I don't know whether anyone would be interested or whether that would be something worthwhile because I think this is this is an issue that's going to get worse over the next few months. So I don't know whether... So what do you think? Um, I, I find it quite difficult to see what that working group would do. Um, what we can do is ask the DW, DWP some very specific questions about the winter fuel allowance and various thresholds um, that are there to see if we can reach some sort of some sort of thought about that, and then we can discuss it in more detail here, and perhaps make recommendations to cabinet about what they can do in response to to the findings. I, I don't think we can do that sensibly through a working group, as I can't quite see the objective. Well, I'll take it away and think about it. <laughs> okay, is there anything else? In that case, can I close the meeting at 6.48 and thank you all for your attendance and participation.